the most unstable planet is the planet Mercury. In fact, you have you should enjoy Mercury while it lasts, right? It's not going to be around here forever. Okay, every time you see it, you should just think, "Wow, like I'm glad I got to see it," because within five billion years, there's a one percent chance that Mercury will eject or eject either collide with Venus or fall into the Sun, things like that. And even if that doesn't happen, as the sun descends on its red giant branch and starts to expand, it'll engulf Mercury. So really enjoy Mercury while it lasts. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 138. And this episode is with Konstantin Batigan, who is professor of planetary science in the Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences at the California Institute of Technology also known as Caltech. And this episode was so fun. I'm quite sad that Constantine is at Cal because he should be at Stanford. And we had a very nice back and forth that I would have liked to continue here. But Constantine works on a wide variety of problems in planetary astrophysics. <laughs> I don't know why I always say astrophysics, but only on the podcast. He works on a wide variety of problems in planetary astrophysics. And we only touch on a few of them. First, we get into the alien-focused, I almost said fueled controversy, but there are debatably aliens to be doing the fueling. So the alien-focused controversy around Oumuamua, which is an interstellar comet, long gone, that passed through our solar system, five or so years ago, I think like October 2017 maybe. And then we move on to interstellar objects in our neighborhood more generally before discussing some of the problems of planetary and satellite genesis. From there, we get into the juicy stuff. Not that that wasn't already juicy. And here I have in mind the death of Pluto, which was proclaimed definitively, much to my dismay and others, by one of Constantine's Caltech colleagues, Mike Brown. And then after that, the hypothesized Planet Nine. So there is a possible replacement for, for Pluto, uh, maybe even a, a probable replacement, depending on who you asked. And this potential planet was provisionally identified by Constantine and Mike Brown uh, pending observation. We finish up with a, a fun exchange about Constantine's hard rock band, The Seventh Season, which has been releasing new music all summer and which is continuing to do so. So I have to mention, as always, that reviews, comments, likes, subscribes, follows, these are endlessly appreciated. Then, of course, there is the greatest fashion empire in the known multiverse, and that is Robinson's Fashion Empire, which you can also find pretty easily, along with everything else through RobinsonAirheart.com. Or you could just go to Robinson's Fashion Empire.com. That works, too. But without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I absolutely enjoyed having it with Constantin. I find it difficult not to ask this question right off the bat when I speak with astronomers and astrophysicists, but I found it especially difficult not to ask you since one, where you were born, Russia, has a distinct history of space exploration, and then two, you happen to be particularly interested in our own stellar neighborhood. So, did you become an, did your becoming an astronomer have anything to do with uh, dreams of being an astronaut as a kid, or is this totally unrelated? Listen, I appreciate you asking, and the the answer is zero percent related. Like I had no, and I continue to have no plans at all of leaving this planet. Right? I just like I love the Earth. I love what it has to offer. The when I was a kid, um, I kind of wanted to. Um, like get involved with cyclotrons. Like I remember being 
eight or nine. Like I didn't really know what a cyclotron was, but I, I knew that it sounded cool. And so I, I kind of wanted to get involved, but, but that, that was kind of my, the extent of my uh, fascination with science early on. So I, I only got really interested in astrophysics when I was um, in college at UC Santa Cruz. Okay. And then since I, I mentioned that I was going to be speaking with Andrew Strominger after this, and you said black holes and string theory could wait, they're not going anywhere. When it came to uh, deciding where in astrophysics you wanted to spend your career, what was it about planetary science and formation that caught hold of you rather than say the exotic stuff like black holes, cosmology, string theory? It was, it was actually the, it was chaos. So I remember having this like realization and this realization came from me meeting my undergrad advisor, Greg Laughlin. I still remember, uh, remain very close friends with him. And, uh, you know, a conversation with him when he kind of explained that, uh, you know, planetary system dynamics is a far more complex problem than it once seemed when it seemed like, you know, things were immutable. Uh, you know, the notion of chaos and stochasticity arises self-consistently in, in simple mechanical systems. I was like, what is this guy talking about? And then, uh, you know, he pointed me to um, some review articles and I never quite recovered from that. Like the the notion that simple dynamical systems can exhibit truly unpredictable behavior was a complete game changer for me. And it's, you know, it's one of these things that happened randomly, right? It is, it's not, I didn't go into astrophysics hoping to learn about chaos and and its applications it just happened kind of organically and it was a complete um game changer and so i was like this is absolutely the coolest math this is the this is what i want to work on okay well i fully intend to get back to planetary system dynamics and then stochasticity which i haven't i hadn't heard that derivative of stochastic before but it is a great word and for those of our listeners who aren't familiar with it it just refers to randomness essentially i think and absolutely yeah considering changing my middle name to stochasticity you know constantin stochasticity that again would be a, a marvelous name it sounds pretty yeah yeah <laughs> well uh the primary focus of your research, as I understand it, or the primary foci, I should say, are on, since we're using nice words like stochasticity, are on planet formation theory and then solar system dynamics, which is where the stochasticity comes in. Though uh, from the papers I've looked at, you've also you've covered a, a wide range of topics. And one paper in particular that really caught my eye that I wanted to start with, uh, it was from a few years ago. It was called On the Fate of Interstellar Objects Captured by Our Solar System. And even before I looked at it, the the title screamed Oumuamua at me because I, I recently spoke with Avi Loeb on the show. And for the just this is going to take me a, a minute of introduction. For those who didn't hear that episode, Umuamua was a comet that passed through our solar system a few years ago, I think uh, 2017 or 2018, uh, you could correct me there, that had some strange features, which led Avi, who's a very accomplished IAS and, and Harvard astrophysicist, to argue that it was likely a fragment of some alien spacecraft or other device. And I haven't gotten the other side of this story yet beyond what many astrophysicists have said to me, which is it's not aliens until it's aliens, which encapsulates their view that it is not an alien spacecraft. So I wanted to start off by asking you if, if Umu is, is fresh enough in your mind, what the most salient or interesting qualities of Umu were, and then how you account for them or explain them if you don't believe it was of alien construction. Yeah. So this is, uh, you know, I haven't, I'll, I'll admit I haven't thought about this problem in a little while, but um, 
if I was to boil it down, like what was the weirdest thing about it, right? It's twofold, really. Um, when it came into the solar system, well, I guess it's threefold. First of all, it had a weird shape, right? Like that's... Yeah, you refer to it as point one. robustly hyperbolic. I loved that. <laughs> You know, uh, it's it's robust and it's hyperbolic. It's both of those things, right? It checks both boxes, right? So it has a weird shape. Uh, although that the hyperbolic part uh, refers to the orbit, and um, oh, it didn't me. develop a comma, right? Right. It's so like a lot of comets when they come in, they puff up. And the, the reason they're called com- comets is because they develop this beautiful tail, uh, otherwise known as the com- coma, and Third, it experienced a non-gravitational acceleration as it was kind of post-perihelion, post-closest approach to the sun, departing the solar system. And the combination of not having developed a coma, not having a jet, so to speak, and uh, experiencing non-gravitational acceleration, which is usually attributed to jets in comets, that's a perplexing and interesting thing, right? So, what is the uh, what is the solution here? Um, well, as you have already mentioned, you've heard that one solution is it's an alien spacecraft, okay? Um, and there are also many other solutions that involve non-alien things, like, um, example, there's a paper by. Um, but uh, Seligman and I, I apologize, I forget the first author. This is a paper in Nature from a little while ago, that, which basically made the point that if it's just a water, ice, regular comet floating through interstellar space, through the processes that occur in the interstellar medium, the ice can become amorphous. So it traps hydrogen bubbles inside of the, the ice. And once the comet comes close uh, and the hydrogen bubbles start to escape from the interior of the comet, they create jets that you cannot see that do not form a coma. Like that's a solution as well. There's a solution uh, proposed by Steve Desch who says this is not, in fact, water ice. It's like nitrogen ice. And, and according to that work, that satisfies the constraint. There, there are some ideas about it being CO ice. So, what I think is interesting about all of this is that um, astrophysics is particularly prone as a discipline to explanations that involve aliens, right? Like, imagine you're a solid state physicist, right? And you're in your lab and you, you know, as happens in regular solid state physics labs all the time, there's something you don't understand about a given material, right? You could always invoke that the notion that this material comes from an alien spacecraft, right? Like that, that is one of the many possibilities that you could enumerate. But, but I, I think astronomy as a field is particularly susceptible to, uh, to pay more attention to the alien hypothesis than other fields. Yeah, that's funny, especially but, but look, because... All, like, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, especially considering the immensity of space and all of the particulars we don't know about, there are so many things that you might hypothesize to account for this comet not developing a tail or its robust uh, hyperbolic... <laughs> What was the word? Hyperbolicity? I don't even remember. Uh, But uh, without having to um, hypothesize aliens. That said, Tom DeLong from Blink-182 is, is, you know, a robust alien researcher. And I think, you know, if we were to ask him, uh, he would robustly point to the alien explanation as the dominant uh, explanation. So, so like, we should go with that. Yes, I would. I am a huge Blink-182 fan. Uh, I know you're a musician. We'll get to it 
before we talked, I was just drumming for an hour or so. And I mean, Travis Barker is great, but screw, but screw Travis Barker. I mean, I want to talk to Tom DeLonge about his robust, uh, his very robust uh, uh, research and he, he's got research opinions. program. Yeah, and he's got I, yeah, he does. What's crazy uh, is who knows, maybe uh, there, I, I I recently watched a video of their show from like 1999. Okay, and like uh, plastered all over like the amps is this like flag that says UFOs are real, right? So that like predates the or more more discussion. So you know the original credit goes to DeLong et al. 1999 uh, for, or really kind of drawing attention to the possibility of the alien hypothesis. They have a great song called Aliens Exist. I don't know if you, you probably already knew that uh, since you're, you're also you know, a fan. Yeah. Uh, something about the 15 year old me is really, is really resonating right now. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I'm glad that I could, reach through our, our two-dimensional connection and bring that out of you. That's good. Uh, through space and time. So, yeah. mm-hmm. of, of more interest to your work than Umuamua and, and aliens is the question of whether or not there are any objects of interstellar origin that have taken up permanent residence in our solar system. So first I I thought I came across a a word that I liked since we've been enjoying some words while we've been talking. And I thought I might ask what the term of art planetesimal. And then I also later encountered satellitesimal, which is another nice word. We'll get to some satellitesimals uh, later, but what is a planetesimal? So the planetesimal is the building block of the planet. Right. The way the planet formation process unfolds is you start out with dust, right? In fact, you start out with a cloud that encircles the young sun, which has mostly hydrogen and helium, right? 99% hydrogen and helium and 1% dust. And all of that dust at first kind of sticks to other dust through um, effectively electronic forces. This is like not too different from how you know, if you don't clean under your bed and you have a hardwood floor, the air currents will kind of make dust bunnies in your, you know, under the bed. But even if you were to wait for a really, really long time, a dust bunny is not going to become a planet on its own. And the reason is that that um, process of creating larger and larger particles just by sticking has a natural fragmentation limit to it. Once these things grow to kind of a size of a centimeter or greater, then their mutual collisions destroy them. And so, in order to grow from sort of one centimeter dust bunnies or millimeter dust bunnies to an asteroid, you need a different process. And that different process turns out to be that within this disk of hydrogen and helium gas, dust accumulates in clouds. And these clouds grow so massive that they collapse under their own weight to form effectively asteroids. And those are the planetesimals. From there, the asteroids collide and grow the planets. And that's how the Earth formed. But uh, planetesimal is the building block. And satellitesimal, by analogy, is the building block of satellites. Some work that I've done uh, you know, in the last few years focuses on the formation of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. And that's a really, really fun and interesting problem. But one of the coolest things I'll say about a satellite decimal is that if you type in satellite decimal into like a Word document, it will autocorrect to satellite animal, okay, which I was was so tempted to just keep, you know, satellite animals in all of the, um, you know, in, in my entire paper, because that's, it just reads so much better than satellite decimal. Yeah, I mean, we don't even need to get into satellitesimals now because you're right, satellite animals is cooler. Um, maybe we should just talk about what those might be. Uh, but one one context, one more context setting questions be- question before we uh, talk about the potential of interstellar immigrants is I don't think that, well, my audience isn't, they're not all 
astronomers. And I don't think people will realize that the solar system is much more than just the sun, our planets, our eight planets, and then the X ninth planet that your colleague Mike Brown uh, killed, uh, Pluto. Um, and we'll get to the potential new planet nine later. But so how big is the solar system, what do you consider part of it? And what are its most peripheral constituents? How far are they? Yeah, um, I think it it helps to think logarithmically when you um, when you consider sort of the scales of the solar system. Right. And and so, you know, there's this exhibit, um, I think, uh, in Toronto, where you can kind of walk down the street and kind of visit the different planets to get a sense of how far things are. But if you adopt the um, orbit of the Earth as a unit, which is often referred to as the astronomical unit, right, then the inner four planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, occupy a region that's that's kind of compact, right? Mercury is at 04 of the Earth sun distance, like Venus is at 0.7, Earth is obviously at 1, Mars is at 1.6. So you can kind of imagine them being pretty tightly packed. And then you have to kind of think in terms of the next order of magnitude when you consider the outer solar system. Because Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the giants of the solar system, are at 5, 10, 20, and 30 astronomical units respectively okay so when you really look at the outer planets the inner planets look like this tiny conglomeration of of little orbs right they're they're really close together but even the outer solar system is nowhere near the end of the gravitational domain that the sun occupies right going out another order of magnitude to say you know 100 300 all the way to a thousand astronomical units that's the domain occupied by what we now call the Kuiper Belt, a field of icy debris that flowed beyond Neptune on very kind of elliptical um, kind of skinny orbits. And as we go yet another factor of 10 further out to say 10, 20, 50,000 astronomical units, that's where we start to encounter the Oort cloud. Okay, and the Oort cloud is yet a distinct population, kind of quasi-spherical population of uh, icy asteroids, which are so far away from the sun that they are not only affected by the gravity of the sun itself, but also by the gravity of the galaxy as a whole. And so their dynamics, the, how their orbits evolve over billions of years, is controlled both by their orbits around the sun itself, as well as the gravity of the what we call the galactic tide. In fact, the um, long period comets that we see that come in from the Oort cloud, the key line of evidence that we have that the Oort cloud indeed really exists, um, all do so because their orbits get modified by the gravitational pull of the galaxy. And by the time we're sort of at a couple hundred thousand times the earth sun difference uh, distance that's when we really start to flirt already with no longer being bound to the sun so there's a whole lot of real estate mm -hmm. one uh, just quick question about that so the kbos which the kuiper belt objects they you said have these elliptical very skinny sort of elongated uh, orbits the Oort cloud, those objects, since they're they're not just affected by the sun, but also, as I think you referred to it as the galactic tide, do they have a similar sort of orbit, or is it much different, or does it vary? Uh, it's a whole it's a whole combination. So they by by virtue of being affected by galactic tide, right? Their orbits are are ever changing. I mean, they're they're changing slowly, but by the dynamics with the galactic tide, they change their ellipticity. The ones that we see are the most highly eccentric, uh, most highly kind of elliptical orbits um, of them because, well, in order to see them, they have to come close to the sun 
so that we see the coma light up. So, so we kind of have a strong bias towards only seeing the tail that is the most highly eccentric. But yeah, if you kind of imagine what the Oort cloud looks like in physical space, it looks like a spaghetti of orbits. Right. And not on a plate. It's like, a, it looks like a spaghetti inside of a washing machine. Hmm. Interesting. So now getting back to that original question that we started with is what are the possible mechanisms by which something from outside the solar system? So beyond the Oort cloud might come to live here with us. And I'm guessing that there's gravitational capture uh, and then collisions might also function um, in conjunction with the gravitational capture, but I'm not sure what else there might be. Not much. So let, let's maybe... Uh, Decelerating you know, spacecraft. Like, that's, that's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but but let's, let's start off with the, I think, you know, kind of zeroth order question of should we expect that there are extrasolar rocks floating through the solar system like is that a crazy notion to begin with right and the answer is absolutely not right like meaning absolutely it's not crazy there it, it is a given that there has to be extrasolar material um you know in flux through the solar system this is not controversial the solar system itself ejected something like 20 earth masses of icy debris um, during the first kind of 60 million years of its lifetime. And, well, where did they go? They now float around through the galaxy, occasionally coming into kind of contact with other planetary systems. And other planetary systems did the same. Right? We now understand that early instabilities among planets are pretty common, and it's common to eject material. And so it comes as no surprise that extrasolar material exists. The, to this end, Comet Borisov, okay, which came after Oumuamua, about a year and a half, um, came and transited the solar system, also in a hyperbolic orbit. It was an extrasolar comet, was perfectly normal. I mean, when there, there were spectroscopic measurements of it, there were things about it that clearly were not you know, identically solar, but, you know, it was a regular piece of, you know, ice that was floating from other solar, uh, from some other solar system that came and uh, passed in our kind of cosmic neighborhood. So it's totally, it's a totally normal, uh, you know, process to consider. Now, the process of actually capturing something onto a bound orbit within the solar system. That's very, very challenging. Okay. That's at the end of the day, the amount of material you can challenge is really, really quite small. And I, I forget the exact number, but I think it's like on the order of the mass of Mount Everest or something that, uh, that you can capture through, um, you know, over the lifetime of the solar system through just gravitational capture. And then you say, well, are there other processes? Well, early on in the solar system's lifetime, within the first few million years, yes, there's gas drag that can help you decelerate and all that. But there's not really much beyond that. Yeah. Space is pretty rarefied in our neighborhood right now. Uh, it but, sure is. Yeah. Yeah. So disappointing that, how little things there are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, something though that you that I guess relates to how little things there are, but that occurred to me as you were responding is you said it's it's quite common to eject material in the first sixty million years. We ejected uh, 20, 20 Earth masses of icy debris, and I'm wondering then. I, you said it, it's 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 pretty rare that that those will come into contact with another planetary system because of the vastness of space. But is it then always? And I'm getting ahead of myself with regard to the planetary with the the solar system dynamics. But is it always a distinct possibility, though small, that some uh, super Earth could come into our solar system from another planetary system and then? 
disturb our orbit and send us careening into the sun or out of the solar system entirely? I mean, sure. And you can do the calculation, right? You can do the calculation to demonstrate the odds of that, right? Now, the the odds of that are negligibly small for time scales that we're interested in. But um, if you're willing to wait, you know, sort of a hundred billion years, so kind of, you know, 20 times the age of the solar system, then that process of passing stars even, uh, right, just random passing stars, um, that becomes an important perturbation for the solar system itself. Right? So eventually, the solar system will get completely disrupted uh, by virtue of passing stars coming close enough to the orbit of Jupiter to just eject all the planets and the sun will be alone. Right? That is that is a fact. And, um, you know, it's a little, it's a little depressing uh, for when that happens. But, you know, all good things come to an end, including the solar mm-hmm. system. No, it's 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 terrifying though because we're even though it's of as you said uh, negligible probability within our uh, time scales, we're always worried about a direct impact from a fairly small asteroid. But there are things large enough that they don't even have to come anywhere near us to cause serious existential problems for Earthlings. But okay, so you have made it abundantly clear that. We it there's almost certainly uh, masses from outside the solar system in our solar system, but it seems that there's been some controversy over whether there is evidence for any particular interlopers in our neighborhood. So, what are the arguments for this, and then where do you stand on the matter? And yeah, oh, I I I really don't think much about it to be honest. I mean, if I were to summarize the yeah if so if i was to summarize look like war are oh more more and comment boris of robustly hyperbolic and extrasolar absolutely right no doubt about it is it a huge surprise no right there should be extrasolar material constantly transiting through the solar system uh, there's some, there's a little bit of tension, I would argue, with the amount of mass that you require, just like in the galaxy. It's not a humongous tension, but it's a little bit on the upper end of how much you require each star to eject to explain these data. But, you know, again, it's it's small number statistics for the time being. Um, so, all of this is, is completely normal, right? Is there, um, is there evidence that this is like alien spaceships um i oh oh i i'm sorry if my question was unclear i wasn't asking if there were alien i i just meant is there evidence that there are interstellar objects residing in our solar system not just passing through that's Uh, what i was asking residing in evidence for particular yeah Okay, great question. That's what I was yeah, saying was don't. controversial. I don't. I, for for the record, I I don't think that there are aliens in our solar system, and I wasn't trying to suggest that. Yeah, I, it's a it's a bummer because I keep waiting. Uh, I keep you know I keep waiting to encounter some. But look, um, the um, the question of like, are there could there have been you know extrasolar meteorites that have fallen on the Earth? Is not a is not fundamentally like a bad question. It's a perfectly good question. The way you do that is you go and you date them, um, and you try to find material that's older than four point five billion years. Right? If you find um, rocks that are that are robustly older than the sun, right? They must have been. They must have come from uh, some extrasolar source and. Um, I think Joe Kirschnick at Caltech spent some time trying to do that. I just been trying to find uh, extrasolar meteorites that are older. Um, didn't find any, but it's not impossible that they exist. There's no evidence that they exist yet. 
but yeah, it's, it's a it's a reasonable, you know, it's a reasonable thing to ponder. Hmm. Okay, well, shifting gears now to the the planet formation theory, and you already touched. We already touched on this a little bit when you answered my questions about planetesimals and satellitesimals, but. Are the first things that form in a nascent solar system... So the first thing that forms, I'm guessing, is the star, right? Or yeah, is it's the star, or is the star and the forming disc. at the... Okay. Yeah, it's the star and the disk and of then, hydrogen, helium, around it, yeah. And then after that, do the planetesimals tend to form... Uh, Earth-sized objects first, or super Earth-sized objects, or the large gaseous bodies, gaseous planets that we have now in the outside of the solar system first. How does this tend to emerge, or at least it, maybe it's maybe there isn't a regular way this happens, but how did it happen in our solar system? So in our solar system, there's a clearly defined chronology, right, wherein. It's clear that the giant planets Jupiter and Saturn, as well as Uranus and Neptune, must have formed within the first three or four million years of the sun's lifetime. Why? Because oh, they weird. have, a, yeah, you're right. Like they have a lot of hydrogen and helium in their atmospheres. The hydrogen and helium disk goes away in the case of our solar system in about four million years. Right. So. That's that immediately sets the clock for you have to form those guys far away um, before the nebular clock runs out. Okay, so the there is debate on a, uh, as to which of the giant planets is the youngest. Right? People usually point to Jupiter as the first thing that has had to have formed in the solar system because it's the most massive, but that's not a settled question. But however you do it, all of that has to get done. All that that plan formation has to get completed within the first four million years. Now, if you look at the inner solar system, right? Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. The case of Mars, we also know that Mars formed pretty early, right? Something like, you know, one or two million years after the sun was born. But the Earth didn't finish its accretion until something like 60 to 90 million years after the formation of the sun. Okay. And we know that from dating the, um, the lunar, like the moon forming impact. Okay. That happened about 60 to 90 million years after the formation of the sun. Some people say, I think it's a little bit earlier. It's maybe 30, but the point is it's tens of millions of years, not millions of years. Okay. And um, and so that, that kind of gives you a sense for the chronology of the inner solar system lagging the formation of the outer solar system. And then there's the final question of, you know, the rearrangement, right? So the solar system as it formed, did it stay the way that it looked? And the answer is no. We know... Um, now that the giant planets underwent an orbital rearrangement, their orbits expanded by kind of a factor of two. And that uh, kind of chaotic expansion led to the formation of the Kuiper Belt. So the Kuiper Belt that we see today, this population of icy debris beyond Neptune, is the leftover kind of 0.1 or 0.01% of a much broader population of icy asteroids that facilitated this orbital rearrangement then got ejected into interstellar space. So there's kind of multiple steps to the evolution of the solar system. Hmm. You said that the hydrogen and helium runs out in the first three or four million years. And is this figure similar for all stars, regardless of size, that the large gassy planets tend to form early and far away? That's correct. Yeah. So if you just look at stars, you know, that are that are a few mil million years old, they show signatures of accreting hydrogen helium. Whereas if you see uh, look at stars substantially older, they 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 don't show any uh, evidence of having hydrogen helium in orbit around them. 
So we think this is pretty generic and the solar system kind of falls into a relatively typical uh, time scale range from this point of view. And then this is something I didn't catch that, but that maybe you said is the reason that the gassy planets form, tend to form far away and the rocky terrestrial planets form closer because the heavier planets can or sorry, the rockier planets constituents are heavier. And just like with the earth, the, the light things tend to float higher and the heavy, heavier things like us tend to, tend to uh, stay closer to the center of gravity. That's w why the distribution is like that, the way the planets formed. Yeah, it's that's not the reason, but it does have to do. Um, that's not the, like, the mechanistic reason, but it does have to do with composition for sure. And the question you're asking is one that you could ask, you know, reasonably at a planet formation conference. And if there's like ten attendees, you'll get at least twelve different answers for exactly why, uh, you know, the outer solar system formed the way it did, uh, why the inner solar system formed the way that it did. But the, um, the work that, you know, I've been involved in uh, over the last, you know, couple of years, what we have um, kind of arrived at is that the compositional differences uh, play a key role. But once you go far enough away in the solar system where ice is... Uh, ice can condense, right? So the ambient temperature of the gas is less than 170 degrees Kelvin and you start to form ice grains, then the effectively the stickiness of ice leads to bigger particles. Like you can kind of get bigger snowflakes in the outer solar system. And because of that, the uh, forming cores of planets can accrete those particles better. Okay, so you much in a much more rapid way through a process called pebble accretion, which we didn't come up with. Our colleagues came up with it, but that process uh, proceeds very rapidly far away from the sun. Conversely, what we have argued is that that process doesn't work at all in the inner solar system. And in, instead, in the inner solar system, you have to rely on much slower pairwise collisions among rocky asteroids to build planets. And that's a slower process in the solar system. In some other planetary systems, the two could actually compete in terms of time scale, right? If you just have more mass to work with. Uh, but that's maybe getting a little bit too much into the weeds. Um, so to kind of circle back to your question, I believe there's a mechanistic difference in how the terrestrial planets like the Earth form and how the giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn form. And that mechanistic difference uh, plays a central role in making, nucleating the growth of the giants in a much shorter time scale. Hmm. Because, uh, so the planets like... Mercury and Venus, they're so close to the sun that the ice doesn't form and become sticky, as you mentioned, and accrete around the the eating nuclear. Okay, great. And one term that I've used a couple of times, but that I still don't, I don't know too much about is super earths. So we don't have any in, in our solar system. Uh, did we have them? What are super earths? How do they form? And I, if it's different from the the way that the Earth formed, and how did they then end up as regular Earths? Yeah, so the question of whether or not the solar system hosted super Earths at some point, maybe early on, again, is an interesting question. I used to think that that was a distinct possibility. I mean, I have a paper um, on getting rid of the nascent super earths of the solar system i think that might not be required to uh, at this point to be honest so some more recent work that we've done merely suggests that uh if you kind of invoke differences in the level of turbulence of, of protostellar clouds or protoplanetary um 
you know, disks, that, that's enough to explain the difference between uh, the solar system and the more common systems of extrasolar super Earths. But to circle back to your original question of what they are, is they, they literally are just more massive versions of the Earth, right? It's, it's as simple as that. Um, for the few or kind of handful of planets where we have measured the densities, right? We know now that most of them fall onto a similar composition curve as the Earth itself. The super Earths are merely planets that are a few Earth masses, right? That are, in terms of size, maybe only a factor of 1.2, 1.3 bigger than the Earth itself. And that turns out to be the dominant outcome of planet formation throughout the galaxy. Okay. Like for whatever reason, most planetary systems do not form the Earth. They don't form Jupiter and Saturn. They don't form the huge giant guys. They form objects that are a few times the mass of the Earth. And these are silicate rich, kind of rocky worlds. Some of them retain hydrogen and helium atmospheres that are small, but um, small in terms of mass, but, but notable. Um, and that's what the typical extrasolar planetary system looks like. Hmm. And huh. so, what role generally do collisions play in the formation process of planets early in the history of the solar system? So, or a solar system. So, you mentioned that the moon impact uh, was very important for dating the the. Uh, the formation of the earth, but were there once uh, far more planetary bodies in our planetesimals? Even? Well, there were certainly more planetesimals, but planets in our solar system that were. Yeah. So, you know, perhaps the conventional way to imagine the inner solar system at the time when the hydrogen helium gas first evaporated, right? Within that first three, four million years, is a large uh, number of Mars-sized embryos. So Mars, in terms of mass, is a, is a factor of 10 smaller than the Earth. And so perhaps when the gas dissipated, it was all kind of Mars-sized embryos plus a bunch of other rocks. Okay, And then over the dynamical evolution that unfolded over the following you know, tens of millions of years, those things collided together to grow into bigger kind of terrestrial sized bodies. So the role of uh, collisions is everything. Right? Like that's how you grow the planet. And what happened to them then? I'm guessing that some of them are still floating around here in pieces and then others became satellite decimals and were still more maybe the, the 20 Earth masses that got ejected from our solar system? Well, so the stuff in the terrestrial region, right, where the Earth is, that all got accreted and became the terrestrial planets. Right. The terrestrial planets mostly is just Earth and Venus, right? Mercury and Mars are 10 and 7% corrections to the mass budget of Earth and Venus. So most of that material got incorporated into Earth and Venus. The 20 Earth masses of stuff that got ejected was much further out. It was beyond the orbit of Neptune to start with. And it was the migration of Neptune and the instability of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune that ejected that stuff. But it's kind of that's happening much further away. And I think you alluded to this when you were talking about your work with Professor Laughlin that got you into astronomy, but I certainly read about it. But we have this idea of our solar system as kind of calm and quiet and certainly no major collisions now and the planet's kind of peacefully moving about their orbits. But you, if you stop to think about it, it really does seem improbable that all these massive masses with their gravities could have aligned themselves so perfectly without just immediately descending into chaos. So how do astrophysicists currently conceive of how things end, uh, ended up so seemingly harmonious when they were once so chaotic? 
Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I think that there's almost kind of like this Zen beauty to the evolution of planetary systems where you kind of, you attain higher level of peace through these, you know, episodes of, of chaotic kind of relaxation, if you will. Right. So the solar system forms at a state that's just marginally, marginally stable. And then through a brief period of violence will relax to a more peaceful state, which will last much longer. And even that state is not indefinitely stable and it'll eventually kind of undergo a different instability, but then relax to a yet more stable configuration and so on. And it's this like, you know, perpetual cycle. So if you were to ask the question of how did the orbits end up in the state where they are today, right? We owe that in part to the fact that the solar system, and particularly the outer solar system, had a ton of icy asteroids when the solar system formed. And the process of ejecting this mass from the solar system, that kind of sucked out a lot of the action from, the kind of, you know, turned down the temperature a little bit on the solar system's dynamical evolution. So after the giant planets, you know, kind of had a brief episode of, of instability, being embedded in a bath of icy asteroids that, you know, paid the price of being ejected from the solar system, right, really calmed everybody's orbits down and put the solar system into the state that we observe today. But even the state we observe today is not indefinitely stable. And the most unstable planet is the planet Mercury. In fact, you have you should enjoy Mercury while it lasts, right? It's not going to be around here forever, okay? Every time you see it, you should just think, wow, like I'm glad I got to see it because within 5 billion years, there's a 1% chance that Mercury will eject or eject, either collide with Venus or fall into the sun things like that. And even if that doesn't happen, as the sun descends on its red giant branch and starts to expand, it'll engulf Mercury. So really enjoy Mercury while it lasts. So enjoy every sandwich and enjoy every uh, Mercury sighting is what I'm hearing. Yes. Mm-hmm. And the other one is the moon, by the way. So like, um, I mean, the moon is not going away, but the moon is receding away from the earth. I don't blame it, frankly. Like, yeah, like I would do the same if I was in in the moon's uh, shoes, but it's moving out at like a centimeter per year. Um, and so the notion of having a full solar eclipse, like that's going away, right? If you wait long enough, the, the angular size of the moon on the sky will be much smaller than it is today. And it won't be able to obscure the sun fully. In fact, the, the, the remarkable coincidence that right now the moon occupies, like the disk of the moon occupies as much area on the sky as does the sun is an amazing coincidence. It used to be much bigger. It will be much smaller. And right now they're about the same. And is the moon moving away because we've done something wrong? We've done something to offend the moon in its shoes? Or is there some better astronomical explanation? I mean, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it doesn't help. You know, I'm sure it doesn't, our behavior is not like, it is not, is not, you know, helping, but it's we've mostly only visited the once or twice in, in a few times in, in many millions of years. Yeah. That's right. It was like pedal to the metal. I'm out of here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's yeah, no, but it, exactly. Uh, but mostly, it's it's just it's just the tides. I mean, so the the moon raises a tide on the Earth, right? The tide crashes into the continents a couple of times a day, and so what happens is that energy gets dissipated, and um, the consequence of that dissipation of energy is that the earth slows down, right? Because the tidal wave, cra- tidal wave crashes into the continents. But in order to conserve total angular momentum, the slowdown of the earth has to get compensated somehow. And the way that it gets compensated is by the expansion of the lunar orbit, because after all, it is the moon doing 
the job of raising the tide in the first place. Well, that is a tragedy. Uh, b- before we move on to, to Planet Nine, though, this signals a good time to shift briefly uh, to moons. And does a similar process occur for moons and other satellites that orbit a planet as far as uh, formation is concerned? So like what, what sorts of factors determine whether this material that's floating around will become a planet or an asteroid uh, rather than a planetary satellite? Well, so the first question, of course, is the orbit, right? Is it an orbit around the planet or is it an orbit around the star? And the boundary lies at something called the hill radius, right? Each planet has a radius around it where if you go beyond it, you will orbit the, the sun rather than the planet itself. So that's that's number one. And the second one is just like the cumulative, cumulative amount of mass that you have in the uh, population of planetesimals or satellite animals, uh, you know, right? If the amount of mass is sufficient, it will, given time, coagulate into into a planet or a satellite. If it's insufficient, like the asteroid belt, for example, right? The asteroid belt is about one one thousandth of the mass of the Earth, right? It'll never form a planet. It's just pathetic, right? Just the asteroid belt is just, why is it even there? Yeah. You know, I'm I'm wondering now, do we actually have any satellite animals that maybe the your your former countrymen sent up, like dogs or it's cats? A good or... question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they used to send up cats, and uh, I think not cats because cats are hard uh, hard to take data from, uh, right? But like, they certainly sent up some dogs. No, yeah, no. Some, in fact, I'm yeah. I'm very impressed with your cat. Like your cat's been, uh, I don't know if it's sedated or or what, but no, it's, no. it's an impressive she's, amount she's, of attention span. So I I interviewed Noam Chomsky for episode sixty six. Uh, that was uh, in March or so, and that was obviously the most exciting interview I had had done to that point, other than. I interviewed my uncle about his favorite ice creams very early on. Uh, But after that, it was Noam Chomsky. And my cat decided to be as crazy as possible during that interview. So the entire time she was just running around and I was so distracted, just like trying to get her off and away from the camera. So since then, I have honed a strategy in which exactly like 30 minutes before an interview, I open up a fresh can of her favorite food and then she eats that, is really excited for like 20 minutes. And then if all goes well, we'll just sleep in my lap in a food coma. So that's where we're at right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can, I can relate to that. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. That's what, I, that's what I did before this interview. I, I ate a little cat food and now just like prevents me from just chilling acting now. out. Uh, yeah, just chilling. Yeah, it, may, it just makes sense. It just works. Um, yeah, what were we talking about? Yeah, we're satellite animals. Yeah, so um, surely there's some dogs that got sent out that never came back. Um, maybe they, maybe right, even well, a we chimp. Got them I, yeah, no, that's right. It's a bit of a bummer. Uh, and by bit, I yeah, mean it's, like it's quite good. a considerable bummer. Yeah. I mean, imagine just being, you know, being that dog. Just like first you feel this ex- extreme acceleration and you're just like, Loading and eventually you you kind of run out of oxygen. It's it's not a good way to go. No, it's not. It is very sad. So we should leave satellite animals as like a very fun uh, typography uh, concern, and then and leave it at that. And actually hope that there are no future satellite animals, unless they are happily housed in in some sort of. Yeah. satellite facility. Unless they want to go. Like dog sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my dog would be happy to go if I went for sure. Um, oh, but yeah. 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 Do, this makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> do, do moons form differently around gassy planets than they do smaller Earth-like planets? Because I mean, there are, there are so many more moons around. 
they do there are so many more moons around our our gassy planets than earth for instance. yeah 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 so i think that the formation of the kind of big satellites of jupiter and saturn is kind of like the formation of the solar system scaled down right happening at a smaller uh scale the the kind of tiny pathetic moons of saturn that are all like kind of 100 kilometers across i think those come from the rings uh they're a bit of a different story but the big ones right for jupiter this will be io europa ganymede callisto right kind of things that are a thousand kilometers in radius um those are almost certainly forming like the planets um conversely right the formation of the moon came from a giant impact right? it was a mars-sized body that struck the earth and you know created the moon in that process so it's a violent and stochastic process a kind of collision as opposed to the more kind of gradual accretion of the of the moons in case of the giant planets hmm. okay <clears throat> well last broad formation question i had before we move on to the ninth planet is there an interesting theoretically interesting question answer to the question of when planet or satellite formation ends in a solar system or around a particular planet? Or is it really just the answer is that when most of the material in a solar system has become compacted by gravity and then their orbits become stable, that's just when it ends? It's, it's really the latter, but that's an interesting qu answer in its own right because that time scale can be very different from system to system. So does, does much of your work, because because what I saw, a lot of your work is really geared around our solar system, but as we are discovering more and more exoplanetary systems, are you increasingly looking at those for guidance? Um, absolutely. My, uh, I would say the last, three papers that I've published, you know, this year that, that I've led are mostly about extrasolar planets. Um, so yeah, they, they present a, an important parallel kind of line of inquiry to the study of the solar system that makes sure that you don't get stuck in an overly constrained world, right? Like it's easy to, you know, when you have a sample size of one, it's easy to come up with the just so story that explains why the solar system looks the way it looks and blah, 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 blah. And um, you end up creating a story that's so constrained that it's not battle tested against the um, kind of broader context of the galactic planetary census. It's very useful to uh, ask the question of whatever story, whatever theory you come up with for the formation of the solar system or whatever, does it work in all contexts, right? A good theory should yield I don't know, the satellites of Jupiter and the typical extrasolar planetary systems and the solar system, all as special cases of that theory, right? And if it doesn't do that, if it fails to uh, explain, at least in a semi-quantitative way, everything, then you're on the wrong track. Well... Great. And now, without any further ado, but perhaps a, a little bit of prelude, Planet Nine. And as we've already touched on, I, I don't, but I'll just repeat, I was so surprised, I mean, to read in one of your papers that the the dynamics of the solar system, particularly the outer solar system, constitute a very long and storied problem in astrophysics that is still very much under investigation because I just would have thought that since it's our own neighborhood, uh, things would have been much more sorted out than they are. But maybe just to summarize, since we've already discussed some of these issues, or maybe we've mainly been discussing the inner, more nearby solar system, what are the main issues that have been so difficult to tackle with understanding the dynamics of the outer solar system? 
Well, the outer solar system, right? And now we're talking about things really beyond the orbit of Neptune, things with orbital periods well beyond hundreds of years. Um, it's only really been unveiled in the last couple of decades, right? We're still learning about it from first principles point of view. Right? We're still discovering um, bodies with kind of semi with separations or mean separations away from the solar system that are on the order of hundreds of um, astronomical units. The, the data set remains sparse there. So the first challenge is that we don't know everything, uh, right? It's not like the asteroid belt where we can kind of go and, and have a very detailed understanding of its dynamical structure. But even with what we know today, it really looks like the dynamical structure is anomalous, right? That, that it's not something that can be readily explained with just the eight planet solar system that exists, um, that we, that we kind of are familiar with. And perhaps the easiest thing to point to, although it's not the only one, is that if you go and look at the outer solar system, a substantial fraction of the orbits all point into the same direction, roughly. Now, this clustering is um, both dependent on the stability of the orbits, only stable orbits do this, and it's not like they're all lined up like a police lineup, right? There's some spreads to them, but on average, right, there's more orbits pointing into one direction than, there, than the other. And, you know, you can just inquire, why is that? Like, why should that be? Why should it, there be a preferential direction and why should it depend on the orbital stability, right? Makes no sense if it's just um, the eight planet solar system. But as it turns out, there are all kinds of other interesting things about the outer, outer solar system that cannot be explained. Like for example, the same set of distant orbits that are, um, that are all kind of pointing in the same direction are also tilted onto a common plane that's about 15 to 20 degrees off the mean plane of the solar system. Again, why should that be? Why should they all share a common orbital inclination pointing in the same direction, right? These are the kinds of mysteries that we are slowly uncovering. Mm. Well, there once was a Planet Nine rip, uh, but now there isn't. And... Before we get to the new Planet Nine, the potential new Planet Nine, what is, and, and, and maybe just to help understand what it means to be a planet, what's the rough story of why Pluto no longer classifies as our interstellar little brother? Or not our interstellar, I'm sorry, our intra intrastellar. Intrastellar, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> little brother. Yeah. Fascinating story, really one of my one of my favorite stories uh, in astronomy as, as to how it all came about. So, the planet Neptune, okay, which is the place to start, was discovered first mathematically. Okay, it was predicted by Orban Le Verrier in 1846, and then it was observed directly. Okay, then. Um, once this was done, there were a bunch of people trying to replicate the success of Le Verrier. Okay, they were trying to like look for additional planets by um, using math, and most of those success, uh, those attempts. In fact, let me just be clear: every single one of those attempts from that era were all unsuccessful. Okay, but there's a guy uh, named Parseval Lowell. Uh, who was living in Massachusetts, who was also, you know, kind of a, like a gentleman astronomer. Like he was, he was, uh, you know, came from a very wealthy family and he was um, doing astronomy essentially, I, w I don't want to say as a hobby, but as sort of something that you can do when you don't really need a job. Uh, and, and so he was observing Mars and was convinced that Mars had canals. He had a specific reason for why this is. He was a pacifist. And so he envisioned this utopian society that lived on Mars where the water was being shared from the civil, like part of the civilization that lived in the pole 
on the pole and like to the equator area through these canals. And he was very upset at sort of what was ha happening in Europe in the early 1900s. And he was trying to like, you know, envision and encourage people to live more like the Martian civilization. The problem was nobody else could see the damn canal, right? Um, because in fact, what he was almost certainly seeing were the blood vessels in his eye. Because when you observe it, it, it helps to look, uh, you have higher precision if you look kind of to the corner of your eye into the telescope. And um, he was probably observing that. And he, at the same time, like because nobody would believe him, in order to prove that he was a real astronomer, right, and that these canals really existed, he was like, well, what should I do? What's going to be like a totally OG, you know, exercise that's going to like make all my critics take a seat? And he was like, I should discover a planet, right, using math. Like that would prove I'm, I'm for real, okay? So, he, um, he hired a bunch of people to do the math. And the, the math they were doing is pretty interesting. They were, they were looking, even though Neptune was discovered, some of the errors in the orbit of Uranus based upon which Neptune was predicted were still not fully worked out. And so, they were trying to work those out by introducing another planet into the solar system. And they, they had predicted the seven Earth mass planet uh, somewhat further out than Neptune. And uh, all of this was published uh, around 1915. And then he died, right? So, like, he died in 1915 or 16. But the Lowell Observatory, which was built in part to look for this planet, which is still very much going strong today, like, kept, you know, kept going. And eventually, um, you know, this planet that they were looking for got sort of discovered, right? And um, it was discovered in 1930. And because, you know, you were, they were looking for something that was seven Earth masses, when they saw anything that was beyond Neptune, they thought, well, this must be it. And, uh, well, this has got to be, you know, the seven Earth mass. Um, object, but immediately there was a problem. So, you see, if it was really seven Earth masses, it would have been large enough to see in the telescope as a as kind of a individual disk, but they couldn't uh, resolve the disk. So, it was collectively decided that, well, maybe it's one Earth mass. Okay. Like, that was a rather arbitrary decision, but you have to remember, it's very hard to measure the math of something if you, it doesn't have a satellite, okay, right? If it has a satellite, you can get the mass from the orbital period, but if you're just looking at an object and you, somebody asks you, like, how much does it weigh, right? There's no way to, to answer that question. And so, between 1930 and 1978, the mass of Pluto kept getting your revised down slowly. It's like, well, maybe it's not one Earth mass. Maybe it's like half an Earth mass. Okay, maybe it's like closer to like 20%. And so, it just kind of kept going down and down and down. In fact, there was a, a, a comical paper that fit a function, like a mathematical function, to the mass of Pluto as a function of time and predicted that Pluto would disappear in uh, some year, like 1989 or something like that. But uh, when Charon was discovered in 1978, the satellite of Pluto, it then became immediately clear that Pluto is a tiny object, right? It's 500 times less massive than the Earth. And the, its, its planetary status was really a legacy status. It was because of um, because what was being searched for was a seven Earth mass object. I see. That is so interesting. I because I, I guess I'd never really looked closely into it, and I'd always kind of begrudged the, the fact that it wasn't a planet anymore because I grew up with it being a planet. But the I think explaining it in terms of the legacy status makes it uh, it make much more sense. But I just want to say I like the that Lowell wanted to shut up his critics with his greatness and then he immediately hired mathematicians to do the work. 
<laughs> that just cracks I me mean, up. I mean, look, I think if frankly, it, it was like kind of, uh, you know, it, it, it was sort of the right approach to take. My understanding was that he was not the greatest mathematician himself, um, but he sort of understood the concept of like the Ford production line and that if you have a lot of a lot of smart people working on something like you can you can do a calculation okay well still though there there remains one question to be answered about pluto and that is what then determines whether something is a planet uh, so being less than 500 earth masses apparently does not qualify it but what are the qualities that would qualify it to be a planet or some X object. Yeah. So there's a formal answer to this, right? Which is that there are like IAU guidelines on what makes a planet. And there are people that like to debate whether those are good guidelines or bad guidelines. They mostly define what a planet is not. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, you can reasonably say, well, these are not the perfect guidelines to be a, for a planet or whatever. But, um, what they are is that you have to be a spherical, right? So you have to have enough mass to condense into a ball-like shape. You have to orbit the sun, which already, you know, you can ask the question, well, what about extrasolar planets? And then the, the third one, which is the most critical constraint, is that you have to gravitationally clear your orbit. And what, what is meant by that is that you have to be a gravitationally dominant player, in the planetary system. The way I like to quantify that final, you know, that final constraint is the question of if you were to remove this object from the solar system, would the dynamics change? Or like would its own orbit notice? And so if you were to remove, uh, you know, imagine that Jupiter uh, is now a sugar cube right? Would the rest of the solar system notice? Absolutely, right? The The long-term evolution of the solar system would change drastically. But if you were to replace Pluto with the sugar cube, nothing would happen. No one's going to care, right? Even Pluto's orbit itself is not going to care. It's satellite animal horses might, uh, might prefer that. But but the sugar cube. Oh, yeah. sure. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Who wouldn't? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So now the new planet nine and Uranus was discovered in, I, I think, 1781 after the, the widespread adoption of the telescope. And actually, parenthetically, as I was reading about this, uh, it was the, the widespread adoption of the telescope after Galileo popularized it. And then I was reading a little bit about Galileo, who was a total dude. He was awesome. And can you, he, he was the, like the only person that had a really good telescope and the only person that knew how to make one. And I could just, that would be so cool to be the only person with a telescope and be the only person that can make this like amazing technology and looking up at space for the first time. Anyways, I just wanted to, to share that. Look, Galileo, uh, I mean, Galileo was truly a remarkable individual. He, um, he I forget the exact quote, but he was like, what, he really understood how complicated the pendulum really is, right? Because the pendulum looks very simple, but mathematically it, it holds so much of the like, dynamical structure that you need to start understanding dynamical systems. It's got a hyperbolic equilibrium. It's got an elliptic equilibrium. It's got vibrational trajectories, circulational trajectories. It obviously has separate traits. Like it has a lot of structure. And so he was, he understood that the pendulum is like an important model for understanding the universe overall. And uh, the, then he got interested in measuring the period of a pendulum, like, you know, because he also noticed that the, um, unlike a spring, the more, uh, the wider it, it swings, the longer it takes. And the way he did that is literally with like a kegger. Like he, he basically got a keg and invited a bunch of his friends 
over and they had a lamp and they would just like drink and count how much, uh, how long it, <laughs> it takes the lamp to swing back and forth. And they're like, all right, now do a, do a little further, you know? And uh, it's just like, that's the way experimental physics uh, was done circa 1600. And um, from what I hear, that's how it's done today as well. Yeah. Well, maybe you can change that or, or perpetuate that rather. Sorry. Go, go back to it. Yeah. Go yeah. back. We, we do too much, too precise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uranus 17, 1781, thanks to Galileo, Galileo the God. And then and you said that, well, right. But because of his, because he, because of the widespread adoption of the, the telescope, I know that he didn't actually dis discover the planet, but, and then you said that, well, you didn't say this, but Galileo, but Neptune was 1846. And this was because of, and, and I don't remember Leverrier was that the name he Leverrier yeah that's yeah, right yeah. He, Leverrier. yeah he calculated where it was based on Uranus's orbit and then a similar process followed with Lowell and and then Pluto in, in 1930 and am I right that you and Mike Brown hypothesized the existence of a planet 9 due to calculations based on similar well it's not similar, but orbital anomalies because the, but this time they're due to objects in the Kuiper belt rather than our uh, neighborhood of the solar system. Look, that's, that's correct. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the fact that material beyond Neptune, right. Uh, orbits beyond Neptune show anomalies, right. It's a different type of calculation, but, in spirit, right, it's trying to look for gravitational dynamics beyond the orbit of Neptune and, and look for anomalies. That, and then you ask, what can they be caused by, right? And you need something. You need something massive to confine the distant orbits of the solar system. Okay. Well, then let's start with uh, the object known as Sedna and where it fits in. And because it seems like it is a special object, has some cousins with some similar properties. That's right. Yeah. So Sedna, the, the first weird thing about Sedna is its orbit cannot be explained. And it's a KBO. With just the, that's right. So Sedna is a Kuiper Belt object. It takes about 10,000 years to go around the sun once. Maybe it's 20,000, um, but on, on that order of magnitude. And... Um, its orbit, despite being quite elliptic, is not elliptic enough to strongly interact with Neptune. So, like, even at closest approach, it doesn't uh, come anywhere near, uh, anywhere near the orbit of Neptune. And because of that, it could not have been emplaced into its orbital neighborhood through interactions with Neptune. Something else is required to explain the orbit of Saturn some additional gravitational pull. Now, that alone is not a smoking gun for an additional planet. You can say, okay, maybe it was passing stars early in the lifetime of the solar system that did this, that, that pulled it away. Okay? But as additional Sedna-like objects were discovered, this population of the Sedna family, as uh, some like to refer to it, it became clear that many members of the Sedna family have orbits that all point in the same direction. Now, that kind of perpetual orbital clustering is something that requires a persistent gravitational torque coming from a distant planet. Hmm. And this this distant planet... That, that's it. That That's actually all it is. You know? <laughs> that's all it is. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, we can end not okay just uh, that was me uh, that, i was like half-heartedly channeling borat and this tie is black not but it, it just didn't work because i i lack sasha Baron cohen's comedic uh, timing and commitment uh definitely his commitment but uh the, the night is young we'll, <laughs> we'll is. see where you end up yeah, yeah. Uh, so what makes the and we'll talk more about okay well I'm going to put that question after this question. We're going to reorganize. So just what makes 
what well what effects precisely does the potential planet nine have on the orbits of Sedna and its family? So over long periods of time, over sort of billion year time scale, what Planet Nine does to the outer solar system is it causes things that align with its orbit to kind of peak in eccentricity. So it become more more elliptic than things that are misaligned with respect to Planet Nine. Okay. And that process of making the orbit highly elliptic jams the perihelion, the closest approach to the sun, into the orbit of Neptune. And not Neptune, with its substantial mass, will then take these objects and just eject them from the solar system. So the interplay between Planet Nine and Neptune cleans out orbits that are that align with the orbit of Planet Nine and keeps the ones that are anti-aligned. Okay, so it creates a pattern of orbital clustering that's effectively governed by orbital stability. It also tilts the orbits of, of those distant bodies into kind of its own plane. So you would expect, if Planet Nine is there, for the distant orbits to both point into the same direction and be tilted by about 15, 20 degrees. That's what we see. Um, third, it, it, cre- it does this interesting additional dance with with distant orbits where it'll take some objects that kind of are tilted in the first place and cause them to go on a very complicated orbital cycle where their orbits tilt all the way to a perpendicular state with respect to the solar system and and create this population of highly inclined bodies. And that sounds a little bit weird because we all often think of the solar system as as being planar, as being kind of a pancake, everything all orbits in the same planes. But in fact, these distant, uh, nearly perpendicular bodies have been discovered. They really are there. And uh, there was a paper a few years ago, not ours, uh, from one of our co- uh, colleagues that even made the argument that the the flux of these objects is much too high to be explained by other means, right? You would you would have to like invoke the sun to have been in a different part of the galaxy recently. Um, so it's it's again this sort of you know not, not, none of these things individually are I would say a total slam dunk, right? Individually they are curious and pretty statistically significant but you know it would help a lot to have a lot more data but it's the confluence of a lot of things simultaneously pointing to the requirement of the same planet that i think strengthens the case for the existence of planet nine right Uh, and so um so that's the that's the important thing that I think oftentimes gets missed in, in the discussion of you know, planet, the evidence for Planet Nine is that it's really the fact that uh, there's multiple lines of evidence for it and there's, there are different surveys that look for, the outer, for objects in the outer solar system and each one uh, looks for it, stuff in its own little way, and has its own biases, but they keep finding more or less the same clustering over and over again. And you know, at the end of the day, you kind of we can sit back and say, look, like the the dominoes are, are stacking up. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that people could probably piece this together. But since we have uh, a powerful astrophysicist among us right now, and it's not me, we should make this explicit. But what what makes <laughs> what makes planet nine a planet rather than just another KBO or a wannabe like Pluto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, well, look, so at the end of the day, planetary status is given to objects that are dominant players in the solar system, right? That cause some important effect in the solar system. And if you know, this is an object that controls large swaths of, of what the kind of outer solar system looks like, then conceptually, right, it must be a planet, right? If you were to remove it, the solar system would look very different. Okay, so it's, again, important to keep in mind that 
a planet is, is really not something that you need a precise definition for. When somebody mentions a star, right, or somebody says a galaxy, like you don't really need a definition to know what that is, right? And, and I think a planet falls into the same category. If somebody says a continent as opposed to an island, you really know what the two, the difference between the two, even though it's loosely defined. Like why is Japan not a continent and Australia is? Like you kind of know the answer. It's the same thing with a planet, right? Planet is planet nine is well in the continent uh category whereas you know things like pluto and other kuiper belt objects are kind of in the island category and then granted that we haven't seen planet nine yet what do you suspect about its mass based on because as you mentioned it well as you mentioned with regard to pluto until we found Sharon, we didn't know its mass. And I don't think you know if Planet Nine has any satellites. But what do you know about its, or suspect about its mass? And then just so we can become more friendly with Planet Nine, what are its other qualities that you expect, like elemental makeup, uh, atmosphere, uh, its intelligent inhabitants, this sort of thing? Yeah, uh, I'm particularly interested in the socio-musicology of the civilizations that don't live on Planet Nine itself, but occupy the satellite animals. More, that, more that audience for Nine. your music that we'll get to. Yeah, uh, shortly. that's right. The the only audience, maybe <laughs> uh, the only audience that can tolerate it. No, I, I definitely read that just a couple more shows and you're going to be the next Metallica. I read that somewhere. It might have been, you might have said that yourself, but I take it as fact, as with everything else you've said. Maybe, maybe, maybe Metallica said that. I don't know. I, I, I just, I don't know. Uh, it's ambiguous. But look, so uh, I can answer the mass question about Planet Nine with some confidence, right? Because this is, these are calculations that we've done. And, um, you know, the mass of Planet Nine clocks in at about five to 10 Earth masses. That's the range in which uh, th that gives the right structure of the outer solar system. And in terms of orbital period, it's sort of 20,000 to 30,000 um, uh, years, right? And this translates to being, you know, about 600 times as far away from the sun as is the Earth. And its orbit is, is kind of appreciably elliptic. That's those are the things that we can calculate okay, using computational models. What we cannot do is tell you what the elemental makeup is because that doesn't enter into the calculation. Like it can be made up of glass, or it can be made up of grass, or it can be made up of rock or ice and some gas would have rhymed much better. With glass and grass, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to, uh, you know, I, I'm not a rapper, right? So I didn't want to go down that path, okay? Because path is another one that that could have could have been a but slant rhyme. Anyway, uh, yeah. So uh, the question of what it actually looks like is is a lot of guesswork, right? It's it's easy to imagine that Planet Nine is sort of a smaller counterpart to something like Uranus and Neptune. So it's ice rich. It would have had a, um, it would have captured some hydrogen helium atmosphere, but we really don't know, right? We really don't know any of this for sure. And then beyond, I mean, before Planet Nine, there are obviously at least two much more likely hypotheses, which are that it's a fragment of a Dyson sphere or it is a massive solar sail. But other than those two hypotheses, are there any alternate hypotheses you and Mike Brown entertained before? Uh, I mean, I don't want to say that you can, well, you didn't conclude it was another planet, but you've concluded that it's very likely another planet because just like with the solar sail and the, the Dyson sphere, even though, they're the three most likely hypotheses. You probably didn't want to just jump to that con those conclusions. You um... Sol solar whale was actually our first one. We're just like, you know, it's got to be a solar whale, but then we d we didn't want to 
we wanted to keep that in the in our back pockets. You know, when when the critics come out, that's when we whack them with the whale. Yeah, I um, like solar whale. Know. Yeah, solar whale. So look, I mean, as far as um, as far as alternative hypotheses, there are you know a few that kind of float through the literature. The the uh, one is everything is not real. Okay, like the uh, notion that there's nothing interesting in the outer solar system going on at all, right? All of the patterns that we see that are anomalous are not actually there. They're all subject to survey strategy. It's all survey bias. Like nothing in the outer solar system is anomalous. And this is one idea that sort of, it has been, it's taken on multiple uh, multiple forms throughout the years. It's gone from people saying the reason we see clustering must be due to weather patterns on Earth. So you only observe during certain times of the year. Uh, and then when that kind of fell out of favor, people said, well, maybe it's because we're avoiding the galactic plane to avoid contamination by the outer, the other stars. Turns out the orbits that we see are actually very close to the galactic plane. So when that kind of fell out of favor, uh, it became this discussion of like, well, it must just be survey strategy. So that's one alternative hypothesis. Okay. I, I don't think that that hypothesis has a high likelihood of being right because you can statistically evaluate what the kind of false alarm probability is. And it's about 0.4%. So that's the number that you kind of have to work with. Like 0.4% is certainly not zero, um, right? But it's a low number, okay? Um, another hypothesis is that planet nine is not a planet and it is a instead a um, sort of five Earth mass black hole. So this was a hypothesis that was born out of the notion that we haven't seen planet nine yet. Therefore, it must be unobservable. Uh, but you really don't have to invoke that because we have not surveyed nearly the um, the kind of entire allowed region of the sky to the required depth to rule out its observability. Okay. Also, five Earth mass black holes um, Probably are things that are rare. Yeah. The, I mean, there are cosmological models that allow for their creation during the Big Bang, but they're not something that comes out of regular stellar evolution, right? Typical black holes uh, start at sort of one point, one point many solar masses, right? Um, another idea was that uh, maybe it's not actually a planet, but the whole kind of distant Kuiper belt has enough mass to self-modulate. Um, my uh, student Arnav, Das uh, recently published a paper with me where we uh, kind of looked into that very quantitatively and that, that doesn't work um, at, at the quantitative level. So, yeah, there there's some ideas floating um, around, but I think, you know, perhaps Planet Nine is actually the, the most boring explanation to it all, right? Because like, Imagine if it was just that, right? It just be like, yeah, the solar system has a planet. We already know there's eight. Like, it must be, might be another one, right? It, it's the most un, uninteresting. Most cool things are are uninteresting at the end of the day, and it's it's sort of the most uninteresting of the explanation. It would be it would be much more remarkable in my view that all surveys of the outer solar system have somehow conspired to produce a pattern of, of orbital, you know, clustering that we, that is so, so remarkable and correlates with how stable the orbits are. Like, like that would be an amazing coincidence. Yeah. I mean, my preference would be for solar whale and we do know that they exist because We've, we've seen analogous creatures in Marvel movies uh, where there are aliens that fly around in like solar fish, which are 
close cousins. Did you just go back in the evolutionary trajectory of these creatures and you find the solar pigs that found solar water and they then you know you know it then they become solar yeah, way whales more, and dolphins yeah, and like but way more prevalent than 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 fibrous mass, mass, like mass wolves, for example. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah. okay but yeah. the, the flip side of looking for other hypotheses and the hallmark of any theory is its predictive power and naturally the best prediction would be or would be observing planet nine but since that hasn't happened yet has the assumption that planet nine is out there been shown to have predictive power in other ways oh certainly yeah you can uh you can look in a rather clear-cut manner at what the planet nine hypothesis predicts for the patterns of distant solar system objects okay so for example one of the things that we predicted in our first planet nine paper back in 2016 was that this pattern of clustering that gets generated through planet nine induced gravity would be special to orbits that do not strongly interact with neptune so as more orbits would get discovered only the ones like sedna that don't hug the orbit of neptune would show clustering right and the ones that do uh, strongly interact with neptune will be much more uniform that's actually you know that's actually visible in the data now it wasn't visible you know a few years ago but we now can uh can clearly see this so it's stuff like that and and also the generation of the highly inclined objects all of that right has um you know falls into the category of predictions that um that you can look for without actually discovering the planet itself now it's not as good right it it would kind of put planet nine into the same category as like dark matter for example where you don't see the the matter itself but you see you know its consequences uh, but nevertheless it is a it is a kind of set of threads that you can look for uh, which are much more observationally easy to discover and then what is the status of that direct prediction of the theory that is namely you will observe it you will observe the planet uh what's going on with that? so it's um uh, in short the search is going horribly terribly because we haven't found it yet uh and that that's all all there is because it's one thing when you're looking for you know, some population of bodies. And then as you slowly discover them, the kind of pieces of the puzzle slowly come into sharper focus. And you can start to think about, is it looking like the thing I predicted or is it not? In this case, we're looking for one thing. And so until we find it, the search is going horribly. And then the moment we find it, the search is over and said it's no longer going horribly. So, so that's kind of all it is. But I suppose, are you, as you gather more data, are you honing in on the space it is expected to occupy or is it getting closer to us and perhaps marginally brighter or are these sorts of things coming into focus? Yeah. On the time scale of our lifetimes, it's not doing anything, right? It just has some brightness. And that, that's what it is. We've, we've searched some portions of the sky. Uh, we've, uh, you know, used existing data. And this is actually, unlike the theory stuff, uh, this, like, use of existing data is something that Mike uh, is, you know, has done a phenomenal job at and has really led uh, in the last few years. And so we, we've chipped away at, um, at, the, at some of the parameter space, but we're nowhere near uh anything that looks like a complete uh complete understanding well last question before we move on to the focus of our conversation which is seventh sure. season satellite and whales oh seventh season yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. which 
what might be good if you start a side project um satellite whale would be nice uh the the question is is there a possibility of a uh, planet 10 or 11 and so on or do you suspect based on all the data we have that if there's another planet it's 9 and and that's it well look, so there's no evidence for more than a single object uh so in the sort of occam's razor way of thinking one should not invoke more free parameters than then they need to explain the data. But the solar system is a vast place and it's got a lot of real estate, right? So if you were to put additional objects somewhere further away, like, is that a possibility? Yes. And there was an, even a paper, I think Sean Raymond was a, maybe first author, maybe he was a co-author on it relatively recently about trapping planets in the Oort cloud. And, you know, there's some non-negligible probability like seven percent or something that uh that a planet might exist in the Oort cloud so it's it's within the realm of possibility hmm. okay all right well we can end the prelude to the more interesting subject of our discussion which is yeah. now the only season. interesting subject yes, of, of yes. ours. You're, you're the front man of a band called Seventh Season that I've been listening to the past couple of days. And before I ask you about the new music, the killer solo at the end of this song, Twisted, which I enjoyed, uh, a question has just recently occurred to me in the past, like, 20 seconds. And that question is, do you dislike mixed fractions why not one year and third season why why seventh season this is not something that i can take any credit for this was uh this this name for the band was conjured out of um out of the ethos of of the universe by like some drunk guy in the soviet union who was my dad's friend in the 70s who at one point was like, you guys should call your band the seventh season. And everybody at the time thought it was a good idea. And so the seventh season was born, I don't know, circa 1973. And uh, I'm just, you know, uh, I, I'm just the latest front man uh, in, in the seventh season, if, if, I, if that. Okay, I did not realize this extended backstory to the band. Well, one, I think the seventh season is an awesome name, but I thought that the band started in high school, your high school, which wouldn't have been 1973. I, I'm very well preserved. Um, you know, I, it's just like I work out every day, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, no. So the, uh, the story goes that, my dad started the seventh season like in Moscow in, in the seventies and they, you know, did their underground like rock and roll thing, uh, in the seventies. And in then, Moscow, uh, very cool. it's sort of, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, in a basement. That's metal. Yeah. To be clear, it was in a basement with a lot of metal in it and like a metal, like a, like a really shitty Soviet metal door that was like unopenable, which is, which is why. How every metal um, band should was, start. Yeah. And so, you know, when, you know, when, um, uh, I started playing music and getting it fit in, it was like, you know, I had a, uh, I had a distinct band in, in high school. And when we broke up, I was like, you know, what I should do realistically it started a band with my dad, right? And so we st we restarted the seventh season. Uh, this was like late in high school, and my dad, you know, realistically uh, played bass. We didn't I think we played one or two songs from the like uh, from the original, you know, nineteen seventy seventh season, but it was mostly just new material. And then, uh, you know, as sort of life has unfolded, we. Um, you know, I, I kept the band going and in the last, you know, few months. So as I'm saying this, I realized that I forgot to put out a new song literally today. 
Uh, I was been working on calculations all week. I literally it completely slipped my mind. But okay, over, with the exception of today, over the last three months, we've been putting out a new song per week, and we're going to keep doing that for I don't know thirty more weeks or something like that. Maybe maybe forty. We'll see. Uh, writing a lot of songs, and and uh, there's a lot of stuff in the uh, in the chamber. So with the exception of today. Um, the the pattern the pattern has been pretty consistent, but your dad's not in the band anymore, right? I mean, in in spirit, everyone who's ever played in, with the seventh season is always in the band. But Everyone's is, always welcome back in the band. It's your yeah. high school band. It's your friends from high school that are in the band now, right? Or am I totally wrong? No, no. So the the current lineup, uh, with the exception of me, the longest, uh, you know, the longest seven season compatriot is Eric Petigura. He's a uh, he joined the band in 2015, and so he's been in the band now for eight years. And uh, he's now a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at UCLA. When he joined the band, he was also at Caltech. He's a postdoc. Then our current bass player um gabriele he came from italy in like 2018 and i remember actually i met him on a bus uh in france and i asked him if he knew where the e like what the e note was on the bass and he was like yeah and i was like yeah okay you're in the band and and then uh about six months later he came to the us uh and so he plays bass incredible guy and max our drummer uh he just joined the band i don't know half a year ago something like he's that good. but he's he's really good he's fantastic uh and uh our other member john uh he's been he's also a drummer uh, we co-write some music together and he's also you know been in the band for a few years but th- there's been there have been a lot of uh, seven season alumni, and and they're always welcome to rejoin the band. Okay, very, very cool. The seventh season, seventy three Moscow. I think it was seventy three. Maybe it was just loosely the seventies. Uh, were your dad and his friend singing in english or did, was seventh season originally some something in russian i think it was like all the original material was in russian and all of the covers were in english but kind of like transliterated like you know when you don't really speak the language but you you can sort of you know sound it out and uh yeah um it's it's crazy. I mean, they. What's amazing is they, uh, towards the late seventies, like built their own home studio by, you know, basically having an engineering background and rigging up a bunch of like tape decks to record simultaneously to create a multi-track recorder. It was completely DIY and you know completely just like no real instruments. Everything was built from scratch. So total totally punk right like it 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 takes the like ethos of punk to to a next level but all of their songs were highly positive like they're just like you know it's just like in the grim you know environment of just like imagine just like gray sky and just the kind of repetitive soviet life right their songs were just like a lot of major chords you know a lot of a lot of fast tempos. Well, I'm wondering because I used to speak pretty decent Polish and I just know, I remember that seven is Shedem. And I was wondering if seventh season was originally Russian, uh, like if they christened the band in Russian and then it only became seventh season here. And because I wanted to hear what it sounds, what it is in Russian. Better than that. uh, Shedem season is a, is a far better is a far just like I, I had no idea that it's it's Shedem. What is it in um, Russian? It's Sid Moisison. Okay. But I hope but it's better, Shedem. Maybe yeah. six is Shedem. But I don't think so. I think it's that's that's I good enough. So. I think it's Pionch yeah. Shesht. 
Yeah. Shedem, Oshem, Novem. Yeah, yeah, it's got to be Shedem. Yeah. 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 Okay. It, sound, it sounds like same. So, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. All, All right. right. Um, I have you for six more minutes to talk about the seventh season, and I'm going to make use of those six minutes. And let's do it. Does this intersect at all with your career as an astrophysicist? Because I saw that you listen to the Beatles a lot while you're working. You've, that gets mm-hmm. the, the astrophysical the juices yeah. flowing. Yeah. So um, I guess in short, yes and no. Um, a lot of people that come to our shows uh, are like, you know, have PhDs or are on their way to getting a PhD. Uh, so it, it's, it's a, um, in that sense, I suppose the answer is yes. Also, the guys that play in the band, right? Um, three out of four, or I guess four to five, you know, have PhDs in, in something astrophysical. Uh, so in that sense, yes. On the other hand, right, it's what we do to, to get away from academia. Right. It's what we, we do. It's completely, you know, it's completely basic and it's so much fun. Mm -hmm. And what is your relationship with the guitar? I guess that's a pretty ambiguous question. So for me, I I play the drums, but I don't really think of myself as a musician. I'm not really that interested in playing in a band or songwriting. But what I really like is the technical aspect of drumming and improving my skills and just learning and doing new things that I haven't been able to do before. And I'm wondering if for you, it's more of an art and it's more about the creating music than it is for me. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm less interested in getting, getting technically good. I, I try to get technically good to be able to play what I imagine. Uh, but I started writing music when I was, um, you know, late in elementary school, um, really trying to copy kind of a lot of the, the stuff that I liked. And, um, it's it's been a part of what I what I've always done. I, I don't think I'll ever stop. Um, I'm not doing it for you know anything any other purpose other than to to have a creative outlet for myself. But I also like to finish things, and I like to create things that are kind of separable from the activity that I have. Right. So um, for this reason, right, we go through the process of recording the album making it sound good, you know, mixing, mastering, all, all of the usual steps and and putting it out for, for others to listen so that fans such as yourself can can listen to that twisted solo on repeat um, in perpetuity and just think, wow. Damn. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I thought. I thought you were wow. expecting I would I would say something beyond the wow, but I just said just no. Wow. That's wow. no. Uh, yeah. and I'm going to remember that two minutes from now. Just wait. But the last thing that I'm going to ask about the the group is just like I asked about the guitar. When you approach songwriting, I recall being really surprised that Kurt Cobain, at least when they first started nirvana he would just like jot the words down like right before they went up he didn't pay any attention to the lyrics but are you your your lyrics as i heard them are much more thought out do you take that very seriously as a creative or expressive uh, practice yeah yeah i think i think i do yeah i mean i um I've never used I, I, like Kurt Cobain was a true genius because he has used the word mosquito in uh, you know in a song that became a staple on the radio and I think it's the only song that uses the word mosquito uh, as sort of a central a central line um, yeah I think as time has gone on I've, I've started paying more attention to the lyrics 
right? And, and have the lyrics, you know, really tell some form of a story, right? Beyond just being things that rhyme, like whale and sail. Well, since we're, we've been talking a little bit about languages and this is what comes to mind is I, uh, I also used to speak Italian and I went to Italian camp as a kid, uh, which is sleepaway Italian camp. That's the kind of nerd I was. And mos- mosquito in Italian is zanzare. And I had a, a counselor named Belceste that I would call my zanzarina. So my little mosquito. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, echoing okay. your wow, echoing your just you ended wow. it with wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, this was awesome. Astounding. Thanks a lot, Constantin. Yeah. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, really, this is a lot of fun. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Airhome. <laughs>